Have you ever wondered what to do then if you are a procrastinator? That's what we'll talk about today. How soon, not now, becomes never. Martin Luther. Today we're going to continue our conversation about the book, The Art of Procrastination by John Perry. This started out as an essay, and he wrote it into a book, and I heard it on an audible book. But again, to me, this book didn't help me as much as it explained to me what was going on in my brain. And once I understood it, I was able to better come up with my own solutions. Today, we're going to pick up about what can we do now that we know we procrastinate on things, either for purposes of perfectionism, disorganization, depression, or we just never get there. (laughs) We look up those movies and we can never remember, oh, that's right, I was working on something. He gives some steps about how you can use some things in your life to help you with procrastination, some simple ones, some more complicated ones that require more time to tackle. But here are a few ideas that he gives you. And at the end, I'll give you a few of my own ideas or solutions I came up with that helped me a lot. He says that if you're going to get distracted by your computer, then you can make sure that you unplug it. And so when the battery dies, it dies with it. You can get to the work you need to. But nowadays, I feel like all my work is on the computer. And so I have to have it. Plus, my MacBook battery is amazing. It'll never go dead. I know for me, too, I used to procrastinate on bills. Now I just auto pay, and that made everything so much better. I feel in a lot of ways technology has made me better as a human being because I don't panic over them anymore. If I have enough money, well, I do have enough money, but I was always late. I didn't have a stamp. Where are my stamps? I can't find my stamps. Where's the piece of paper? Did I misplace the envelope? Now everything is much better for me. And he says a lot of this has to do with attention deficit disorder. Of course it does where you just get distracted and you can't find this and you can't find that. And then the disorganization comes through and now you're really lost in this. So if you're trying to avoid doing work, being disorganized is a great way to do it because you can never get anything together at the same point. But now with computers and organization, it's imperative to find a system that does work for you. Again, I found one that works for me. I keep my inbox clean. Anything in my inbox is something I have to do. So I know what it is I need to do. It doesn't get put in a task. It doesn't get put into an important folder. Now I figured out a system for me. He says it also helps, too, to collaborate with other people. And those people who are great at tasks and do everything that they're supposed to do are gems. My best friend is one of them. And it feels maybe a little bit like you are taking advantage of them because you're going to have them come in with your projects and help you to do it. I know at one point I invited my best friend to go to the gym with me because I knew if she went to the gym, I would go to the gym with her. It's kind of hard to lay your tasks on other people, but when it works, it's amazing because not only does that person help you get those things done, but for me, I do things when I feel obliged to do it. I imagine my customers thinking, where's Jill? Is she never going to answer my email? Boy, or because I work in medical research software, what if my not getting a task done causes someone to not get a medicine as early as they possibly could get it? I don't want to be that person. So I had a lot of external reasons why I needed to get done. I think that's why this job worked out so well for me, because me imagining someone not getting their medication motivated me to get my work done and has made me a very good employee. But when we have a collaborator on there, having that other person doing work while we're not doing work, that doesn't really work. You feel bad. You feel like you're burning up a trust relationship with someone else. And so then suddenly you feel like doing your part because they're doing their part. He said that other times, if you wait too long, sometimes other people will do it. Maybe the problem goes away. Maybe the problem stops being a problem anymore. And even though you escape, you're sort of kind of a jerk for just ignoring tasks just so that they go away. I had one person, and this was a good example of it just going away. I knew that when they came to me for help, they never did their own research. They looked at me as the first resort for trying to figure out how something worked. I really wanted them to learn the tools so that they could figure out how to 
find these answers for themselves. So if I ignored them for a little bit and procrastinated on what they asked me, they would probably about 15 minutes later come back to me and say, oh, never mind, Jill, I found the answer. Cool. So in a sense, I was helping them at the same time it was helping me by not taking on all their tasks too. We talked about Kaizen in the past. We'll do more about Kaizen, but it's also about doing small steps and incremental improvements. And that's what we want to do as a procrastinator is start tackling these issues one by one, the perfectionism, the storage method, you know, all the things that we're doing. Because in the end, if we don't do this, we're getting on the nerves of other, we're annoying other people, and that's not great. We really want to tackle these problems so that we can have better relationships, get our goals, do the things we want to do. So it is important if you're a procrastinator to actually work on this project. He says in the end that we hope that we're rational people again, like I said from the beginning, and that we can look at what's most important, figure it out, and get those things done. But unfortunately, if there is such thing as a rational person inside of you, there's also a curious person inside of you. Hey, when was the last time Meg Ryan was in a movie? Or the sleepy version of you, he said, who just wants to go back to bed. Or me, who's looking for a snack, and I go find out the most time-consuming snack possible and go make a bowl of popcorn. So we hope that we could be the person who gets things done, but our willpower, our other versions of ourselves, all the other things we have to get done kind of confounds our ability to do it. So we're going to have to take small steps. We're going to have to come up with small systems and solve them. We hope that there's this magic book, and there's a lot of books out there that talk about procrastination that will show us how to cure these problems. But I think why this book worked for me is he told me why this was happening. And as soon as I understood the why of it, then I could go after the individual problems I was having for myself. One, I was a perfectionist and I had to let that go. Things were not going to be perfect. And if I procrastinated on them, they're definitely not going to be perfect. They're going to be worse. Two, is causing stress, not only in me because I needed to get these things done, but in people around me who felt they had to do things for me or egg me on all the time. Also, it was preventing me from getting the things I wanted to get done in life, which meant my own goals. So it wasn't like I was torturing other people for the sake of torturing other people. I was in there with you, hoping Jill gets things done. But he says we need to figure out how to enjoy life too, pat ourselves on the back for the things that we get done, and then tackle all those things that we're trying to solve now that we figured out what is actually causing the procrastination. He says there's a lot of books out there, but a lot of them make you feel bad, call you lazy in many, many words, or make it seem like you won't do the task. Just get organized. Just write them down. And that's not the solution. We know that. We understand that. The problem is, is how do I get there? So he said that you have to find books that are actually just tackling some of the things you're looking for. And he doesn't wonder that in some cases, he talked about it earlier, about depression being tied to procrastination in some sense, that if we just focused on making ourselves happier, would we have more energy and feel more motivated to get things done? And I think, too, that was what was helpful for me. The more I got successful, the more willing I was to actually do things and get things done. And because I wanted to be happy and I wanted to have time and I wanted to be successful, suddenly I started just backing up a little bit. For me, what I started realizing is I got really unhappy when I had to stay up all night working on a project. What if, Jill, you just backed it up one step, backed it up a day? So then maybe you stay up late, but it's the day before the project gets done. And slowly I started working very incrementally on backing up my projects. It's not like it's less work to do a project late. It's the same amount of work, if not more. You actually save time by being able to do it earlier. He says, too, that if we want to get happier, he suggests the Happiness Project. And we did a podcast on the Happiness Project. And the show notes will have a link to that episode. But Gretchen Rubin does a great job where she just spent a whole year asking the question, how can I make myself happier? And she helps you. Create your own kit for doing that. He says, too, then it's really good to set reminders, to-do lists, pop-ups, anything that will help you 
Remind yourself about the things you're looking to do. Again, I use the app Todoist. I also use another app called Streaks for more habit type of things like taking out the trash every day, throwing one thing out in my basement I don't want to have every day, exercising every day, clean something little every day. And when I do those streaks, my watch beeps at me, I get a little pop-up, and it reminds me that I needed to get those things done. For habit types of things compared to to to-do lists, Streaks is a great app for that. I believe it may be only on iOS. And then he says in the end, start looking at your stats on accomplishments. Again, when I looked at this book and I started realizing, I get a ton of things accomplished. The problem is, is I was getting all the wrong things accomplished. I wasn't accomplishing anything in my life that actually mattered. Once I started focusing and cutting out the things that don't matter, suddenly I had time to do the things that did matter. He says that we should work on our depression if we have depression. He doesn't know if procrastinating causes depression, if depression causes procrastinating, or maybe the two just reinforce each other. But he suggests it's a good way to get one of the core problems solved so you can actually start getting things done. Helping yourself with the depression will help you with your procrastination. After discovering some of my root causes for procrastination, I came up with some methods to help me get over it. First of all, scheduling. Talked about how I used to do it. I used fantastical. Putting in your task at a specific time during a day. This is the time I'm going to exercise, my perfect day. Will it happen every day? No, but if you schedule it, it will certainly be a lot better. So then when you schedule something, you're essentially deciding ahead of time what you're going to do between this time and this time. Talked about it in the past, but make it easy. If you're exercising, you set out your clothes. If you're going to work on a paper or the passport for your upcoming trip, Get every material you need, set it out, and put it in a little pile in the appropriate place so you'll see it. I start out every day by reviewing my top tasks. The one big thing I need to get done more than anything else. Then I come up with a few other tasks that would be great if I could get done. I do this list once for work and once for my home life so that I can get things done that's important. Then my very last task that I do at the end of every day is look at tomorrow and set up the three tasks I hope to get done that day. Giving yourself intermediate goals will help you. So for instance, he struggled with reviewing papers for his students. So if he had scheduled, I will read one hour of this paper during this time to this time and not make it so large, breaking it up into smaller chunks. So he will read one hour of the paper and then he'll do something else. The next day, he'll read another hour of the paper, then he'll do something else. But by setting smaller goals, like if you were a writer, write a thousand words. If you're an exerciser, I just have to fill up the ring on my watch, something that you can do and accomplish. Chances are, if you get started, you might even do a lot more than what you were planning on doing. The next piece of advice is that I set up my environment so I succeed. If my phone is causing me distraction, I put my phone someplace else. One of the reasons I really wanted an Apple Watch, and you can decide what your own technology is, I wanted my phone away from me at times. And what if I got a call? What if something important happened? Or what if I get a notification about my meetings that are coming up in just a few moments? If I have the watch and that becomes my notification device, my phone, which has all sorts of games and other silly things, can go sit over there. Maybe I get distracted because there's too much clutter in my office. So I get rid of the things that are causing me to walk away, do something else. I've even had times where I got like a second drink. I get a glass of water, I get a second glass of water. I put them both there so that I can focus more on what I'm doing instead of getting halfway through the project and think, I'm really thirsty. I'm going to get a drink of water. If you do use smartphones and you are struggling with it, there's ways that you can keep focused modes. I'm not sure about um, Android and what they have for it, but in the Apple world, Mac and iOS, there are focus modes. So in a focus mode, I have one that is for sleep, 
Nothing's allowed to bother me except my closest friends, my mom, my brother, calling me. It's the only thing that ever beeps. Someone else calls me, it's not going to interfere with my sleep. Then my work focus mode is that the games, chats, other things don't beep at me. If someone texts me, usually tends to be a little bit more important, I allow that to get through. Focus modes, at least in the Apple world, are really good because you can actually say who you want to be able to reach you and who should not be able to reach you. So you can really trim this down. I have a recording focus mode that only some things are supposed to alert me because I'm trying to talk about this podcast. I don't want to get all sorts of notifications. So I use technology to help me with staying focused. And then I have some basic rules. We talked about setting up rules for yourself. One, I'm not allowed to turn on my television during the day. Seems kind of dumb because why would I, you know, turn on my television during the day and watch TV while I'm working? But it's an easy thing to say, oh, I was really interested in this documentary. At lunchtime, I'm going to watch it. And then my brain is all off into another direction. My TV stays off. Music is allowed to be played. Podcasts are allowed to be played. But I also have a focus classical music playlist that is just instrumental. So when I'm trying to write, my attention needs to be very dedicated. I will be able to focus because this playlist is dedicated to me being able to pay attention and do something difficult. If I'm writing something and I need that, I have a focus mode that goes along with the playlist, that goes along with everything else. And then I find what usually distracts me if I'm having a huge trouble focusing in general is it has to do with a lot of little things not getting done. If I make lunch and I suddenly notice my sink is full of dishes, oh, I'm just going to put the dishes away. I work remotely, so it's easy to get diverted when you're at home. To be honest with you, I found it easier to get diverted when I was at the office. I'm such a social person that it was hard for me to focus at time. Home is a lot better for me. But even at home, if I see the trash needs to get taken out, the dishes need washing, those can throw me off a little bit. So I always make sure that I, at the end of every day, I reset for the next day. And on Sunday, I reset for the next week. That means I try to do as many things as I can. I straighten up my living room. I do the dishes. I set out the things I'm going to eat for lunch. I try not to have any distractions just sitting around the house. Because as soon as you're about to work on a project and you see, you know what, that box really needs to go in the basement. You pick it up and you walk it down to the basement. Now you're lost in the basement again. We don't want to go to the basement. So my preempting any possible distraction during the workday has to do with me getting some tasks that are going to annoy me, that I know will annoy me, done before I even start work. Or I start working on this podcast. And the last bit of advice is that I discovered what someone called the one-touch system, which is essentially if a task is quick, like under five minutes, just do it. Just do it right now. Because some of the things that happens when we get all these tasks, we're starting to now manage our tasks, and then we're moving them around, and we're putting them in a system when we could have just done the task. If someone had a quick email Hey, Jill, do I press button A or pr button B in order to get the software to work? I could create a task, set a reminder, remind myself to email the person, or right then and there, I can just say button B and send the email off. No drama, no writing a big, thick email around it, just get it done. And so if you can get rid of good, I, I think solid 70% of the things I need to get done, I get done in that one-touch system where you're not moving pieces of paper around back in the day when they first came up with it. You're dealing it with that instant and throwing it out. My license renewal comes in the mail. I pay for it that moment and it's gone and I never forget. So that's another recommendation I have in order to help you get things done. Try to prevent things from becoming tasks at all. So those are my tips. I hope they help. Procrastination is such an insidious thing that just eats away at your time. The problem with it is it's not like a problem that you're trying to solve that's big in your life. You know, like you have to buy a house or you're 
trying to look for a new car or you have some systemic health problems, you are trying when you're procrastinating of stopping something from just eating little bits of your time here and there, just nibbling at it. And by the time you look up, suddenly it just nibbled away all your time. By conquering procrastination, by looking at the root causes and then solving them, you'll start having more time to do things, more time to get things done. I don't procrastinate on this podcast, and so I have more time to do more podcasts. It all works together. My challenge to you is think of one thing you could do that would avoid a problem that you're going to have later that will cause you to procrastinate. Something that you always get annoyed with, and then suddenly you're dealing with it when you should be really doing something else. Maybe working, maybe spending time with your kids, maybe doing something fundamental in your life. But you always notice, oh, I should really pay that bill. See if you can't schedule those annoying tasks so that when you're sitting down to write, to play with your kids, to do your work, those things are no longer staring you in the eyeballs. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. And remember, you can send email to me at jill at startwithsmallsteps.com. Our road to progress in spite of procrastination starts with small steps. <laughs>